Welcome to the St. Louis University Craft Talks, part of the St. Louis Literary Awards series of programming with our host, Ted Iber, and special guest, Monica Sook. The St. Louis Literary Award was created by the Library Associates of St. Louis University in 1967. To learn more about the Literary Award and the writers that we have honored over the years, check out the book, The St. Louis Literary Award by St. Louis University Archivist Emeritus, John Wade. We would also like to thank our sponsors for the Craft Talk series, Left Bank Books and Caldi's Coffee Roasting Company. Left Bank Books is one of the oldest and largest independently owned bookstores in the nation, offering a full line of new and used books, gifts, cards, magazines, toys, and services. You can order Monica Sook Works at a 20% discount if you let them know that you saw this interview. Caldi's Coffee Roasting Company is dedicated to creating a memorable coffee experience for their customers and guests, committing to sustainable business practices, providing educational opportunities, and supporting the communities in which they serve. And now, without further ado, Monica Sook. Welcome to Craft Talks. My name is Ted Iber, the Executive Director for the St. Louis Literary Award at St. Louis University. Monica Sook is a Cambodian-American poet and a daughter of refugees. She is the author of the brand new A Nail the Evening Hangs On from Copper Canyon Press. Her work has been recognized with a Discovery Prize from 92Y. She has received fellowships and residencies from the Poetry Society of America, Hedgebrook, the Elizabeth George Foundation, the National Endowment for the Arts, Kundaman, the Jerome Foundation, the McDowell Colony, the Salt and Stahl Foundation, and others. Monica Sook is a Jones lecturer at Stanford University and teaches poetry to Southeast Asian youth at the Center for Empowering Refugees and Immigrants in Oakland, California. She is originally from Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Monica Sook, welcome to Craft Talks. It is such an honor to finally get to speak with you. Thank you so much for having me here. I really am so excited to be in conversation with you. So thank you. <laughs> yeah. Um, Let's, uh, let's go ahead and start it off with some questions on writing process. And, um, and along the way, I'm going to actually ask you to read uh, a few of your works. And I, I should actually start by, um, I know you just held it up. Congratulations on the release of A Nail the Evening Hangs On. It is amazing. Thank you so much. So excited. It's so amazing to see where the book is going, you know, and, and where it's being held and where it's being read and who's, who's, who it's like reaching. So I really appreciate the enthusiasm and the support. So I thank you. It means a lot to me because I just don't know. I don't know what's well, going on with the book. <laughs> All right, well, I'm gonna fire away. Here we go. You said that uh, you see the poet as a, uh, as a vehicle for the poem, and that at times you felt guided by your ancestors as you write. Mm -hmm. How does inspiration strike you, and what does that feel like? So um, I love this question because it has to do with ancestors too. Um, I often am listening for the words, and I find a lot of inspiration through my family, at least for this first book. You know, um, it was really grounded in um, the exploration of family history, intergenerational trauma in my own experience as a daughter of refugees and genocide survivors. So I was actually able to um, just like go to Cambodia, be inspired by the actual um, landscape, my ancestral homeland. And I was also um, excited by all of the different kinds of mythological characters that were imbued in like the temples. Um, you have the Naga snake, you have Apsaras, and um, you have all these different celestial beings um, that are very much part of the landscape. So that made its way into my imagination. And I think that really inspired me alongside the actual um, history of the atrocities which forced me to look at what happened during the genocide um, to my family and then to the whole country um, of Cambodia. Like I had to look at it directly, but I also needed a little distance, you know? So the inspiration 
um, came from the actual oral storytelling from family members, my mom, my dad, my aunties, my uncles, um, and also just absorbing the people and the landscape itself. And then naturally absorbing like the ancestors and what they were communicating to, you know, in a, on a spiritual level. So I got to um, just kind of pay attention and the language led me to be in conversation with those in the past, present and future. And I really do believe that my poetry is able to time travel in that way. So that's the, that, that's the kind of vehicle I'm talking about um, that we can travel through time um, and that we can also um, contact certain elders. I know that might sound woo woo to some people, but I mean, I don't <laughs> think so. You know, I think it's very much, um, it's really important to me that I acknowledge that I am um, a poet and writer. I'm a Khmer woman who has inherited this dark history, but not only have I inherited that history, which took course over the span of four years from 1975 yeah. to 1979, but it's like the entire, like my entire history reaches way far back to ancestors I didn't even know. So I think that there's a kind of intergenerational knowledge and wisdom that's passed down as alongside the trauma, you know? Um, but that made its way into my work. And that's what I mean when I say this is a vehicle and here's who I'm contacting in a way through the poetry. Uh, beautiful. <laughs> so that, no, seriously, I just, I think that was just a beautiful explanation of it. And, and, it, and I think it'll, it, that, that really resonates. And I think I, you're not the first person I've heard, uh, particularly artist who has talked about that intergenerational uh, connection. Um, and I find it fascinating. And I, and I have to say, it's a bit of a shared experience for me as well. Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, but I, I just think that you, you made it very clear. Mm -hmm. You said that you utilize myth making in your work to mm -hmm. shield yourself from the actual horrors about what you've, what you've written. And, and you, you glanced on that a little bit. You also say that you use myth making to begin to address intergenerational trauma uh, directly. So can you describe um, a little bit um, what the thought process is for you that goes into that? Yeah, um, so because the subject um, I was focusing on was so heavy and not only was it just because it's genocide, it's something that my parents lived through and actually um, fled, um, you know? So um, I think that even just hearing my father tell me stories directly, I think even mm -hmm. he was kind of doing a little myth making, you know, and um, there were stories he would tell me that I would ask him about later and he would be like, oh, I, I don't know what you're talking about, you know, and oh, actually, to kind of tie it back to the first question, actually, whenever my parents and I would talk about what they lived through during the genocide, whenever that came up and broke through the silence that they had already kind of established when, during my childhood, um, whenever we were in a car, and we were driving somewhere, they could talk about what they lived through because they were in control of the vehicle. And they were also in a kind of safe space. So they're not like- Oh, that's fascinating. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So I think that is connected, you know, um, that you have control um, over a history that you didn't have control over. But the myth-making for me happened when um, I realized I was writing about history like directly like this is what happened and it turned out to be like a report like a history report um but I, but then you know i would read and research um and just read certain textbooks and um it just gave me the the bare information this is how many tons of bombs were dropped in cambodia during these years and and it's just like it's overwhelming to read something like that and to know that that affected your family mm -hmm. and that's why you're here and you're born in america you know so um, in order to engage with that history, which I felt was so important for me to do, um, I decided that I had to transform the history. And my heart was so broken in a specific time when I was writing the, my poems, I was, so, I was so heartbroken because I realized I could not change history. I could write a poem about it, but I couldn't change the results. So what could I do? I had to move towards myth-making. I had to move towards some kind of like in a way magical realism perhaps, I had to really 
um, create a little distance between me and like my father's story, me and my mother's story. But if I had to look directly at history, I would do it in a way that would help me empower the narrative. So that's what myth making means to me. So I, I um, it, it relates to another question I've got later on. I'm gonna wait on that question because I think it's important, but it, it, but it has to do with, with when, when you said that you can't change history, mm. the question later on will allude to, but what can you do for the future? With your work but again we'll get there we'll yes. get there shortly i will think about that um so okay so here's a here's a process question um mm -hmm. as far as writing habits or rituals do you have any um you know i think that yes so here's here's what i like to do ideally because <laughs> it's not consistent especially now during the pandemic but ideally when i have a lot of unfettered time what I like to do is read a book in the morning, maybe as soon as I wake up. Um, I don't look at my phone, right? I read a book and um, I will also write a poem, like just write something, anything. It doesn't have to be like, here's what I'm intending to do. Here's a little blueprint for the poem. Like I'm not mapping anything out. I'm just going to write and let the language lead me. And I don't judge that. I just, I write it down on a legal pad. And that's like a bare kind of kind of like you know document. Like it's not like a notebook with a lock and key or anything. It's and it's not just in my computer. It's not digital. I have to write like with my loose um what's the call like loose loose hand or something. I have to write by with Pretty pen and paper. <laughs> yeah, I'm like how do I talk again? <laughs> so I have to write on paper, and um, after I've written that, then I will maybe transcribe it. But lately, I've been you know, maybe reading a little bit whenever I can, because I'm also teaching at the same time. And I'm also just surviving the pandemic and taking care of myself, you know. Um, but I, I am like, like reading a little bit here and there. And if something comes to mind, I'll just write it down. And it will be on paper, but I will also put it away in a folder so I can return to it later. And I'll have like fresh eyes when I actually look at that piece of paper and I'll transcribe it then at that point. I like to put things away in a drawer so that I don't have to, um, so I don't feel like I'm tinkering too much with what I just did. You know, like I, I think that I, you can ruin something good that's just starting to happen when you force too much, like, like you force your seeing onto it in a way that it doesn't actually want you to have that gaze. And so much about my writing is like resisting a kind of gaze, you know, that mm -hmm. is forced. And I don't want to do that to my own poems or my language until I'm ready to look at it and say, oh, here's what I'm gonna add. Here's what I'm gonna do. But during this time, I've struggled to write. So what I've done is just write one word at a time every day, one word, and they call that enough. And then the next day I, I might write a fragment then maybe it'll turn into a sentence and then it might turn into an entire poem. And then, you know, it's just like low stakes writing. It has helped me just kind of move towards my love for language, my curiosity for it. And that's what I'm trying to nourish. You know, when I sit down to write, that's the ritual is actually being gentle and maybe having some tea by my side as I'm doing that work. So that's what I like to do. <laughs> yeah. Boy, that, the, the immediate analogy that comes to mind is, is Tibetan monks, uh, artisans um, with, the, mm -hmm. with the sand paint, with one grain of sand at a time. Yeah. Yeah, um, I, I, I've seen that when I was in a McDowell. Um, mm. That's where I, where I wrote most of my book, actually. But there were actually monks who were creating that mandala. Oh, oh wonderful. Mm -hmm. So um, in addition to your poetry, you also write essays. You've written for, and I believe the pronunciation is Vida. Is it V-I? It's V-I-D-A. Oh, yeah, maybe it's, I think it's Vida. It's Vida, OK. Um, a nonprofit intersectional feminist literary organization and the NEA arts magazine with equally compelling style and emotion. You. Can you talk about um, how you structure the writing process for these kinds of different writings? Um, so I agonized over both essays because I have yeah. a lot of trouble um, organizing my thoughts in long form. Um, and I would say like, you know, my, my poem to slang, which is in the middle of the book, it's a long poem as well, but mm -hmm. that the the length of a piece sometimes it feels a little bit um, daunting to actually tackle. Um, but it did take me some time. I think that with um, 
the essay on fear, fearlessness, and intergenerational trauma for Vita, mm -hmm. that essay is something I would like to revise still. And I'd like to, um, you know, go into that a little bit deeper um, and sharpen up the language, you know, so I, I like to revise. But that essay, it just took me a long time to actually start writing it. But someone had approached me and asked me if I wanted to contribute something to the magazine. And I thought, that's great. I have, I do have something that I'd like to say. Um, and then I think it was just about giving myself the permission to write about that journey, you know, because it also involved my experience in the MFA program and also just my experience as a daughter of refugees who was learning about intergenerational trauma and how that's passed down. Like that was like a very fresh um, moment for me to kind of be validated in a way. Like this is something that is genetically passed down and oh, that's why I'm feeling overwhelmed or that's, that's kind of what I'm feeling, you know? Like I have, I identify with that experience. So writing that essay, um, I need a lot of structure. And um, I was able to write that because I had written, an, uh, I had read an essay by Zadie Smith and I can't recall what it is now, but it was really helpful for me to, to like read and write at the same time. But the Weaver in My Poems, that essay for um, NEA Arts Magazine, that was, a, I put a lot of pressure on myself because it was about my grandmother, you know? Mm -hmm. And my grandmother is a master weaver who's also been recognized by the National Endowment for the Arts um, as like a National Her Heritage Fellow. Mm -hmm. um, she, she had gotten that award when I was born in 1990. And mm -hmm. so um, there's like a lot of beautiful connections there. And she's like the first artist I knew. And I, what is something that surprised me so much is that there are people who write about my grandmother, like textile scholars. And she's been, you know, documented in lots of different ways. Like I could, you can Google her. Her name is Bun M, um, B-U-N-E-M, but in, in the English uh, is, is M Bun. So anyways, I, I was just so, so careful to, to like try to represent, I was trying to represent her well. But writing those essays um, back then, it was taking, I was doing that uh, as I was also writing the first book. Now that I finished the first book, something I'd like to do now is explore essays, you know? And I, I feel a little bit more grounded in my writing practice as a poet. Now it's about developing my writing practice as an essayist as well. Yes. So I'm glad that you asked that question because I am really excited to write essays. And I, I love um, Alexander Chi's essays. Um, and like how to write an autobiographical novel. And um, I'm inspired. I want to, to kind of do something. I want to do a book of essays one day. So you, so you had, um, you said that you wrote early versions of ABC for refugees mm -hmm. and it took you six years to fully realize it. So before I ask you this, this next question, I wanted to know if you would be willing to read the poem. I would love to read the poem. Yeah, I am happy to read the poem. Um, it's one of my favorite poems to read, actually, because it's so much fun. Um, okay, here it is. Cherubi D, how does a man who doesn't read English well know that Cherubi dumb? Those aren't really words, BD, but birds. Cherubi dumb, he stumbles, reading to me by the sliding glass door, Cherubi D, through which I watch my brother play in the dumb, dumb yard. Cherubi D, Cherubi dumb, like how my father says, fine then, leave, my mother shouts, stupid, dumb. We live in a small BD nest too, one hallway to be dumb, slam doors. Birds, what are birds? Thanks to my father reading with me, I have more feathers. T-H-E, first word he ever taught me to pluck. It is a word used all the time. Cherub, cherub, dum. The mail, the mailbox, the school bus, the, the. He asks me to read the mail, not birds, mail. If you don't read this, you will turn into birds. And I read it to him the best I can. The end, a feather, two feathers, the, the end. Mother, mother, repeat after me. Cherubi D, Cherubi Dumb, we read together before bedtime. Thank you. Oh my gosh, I love that poem and it is so great hearing you read it. It's, <laughs> it, it's so different. I mean, I actually have, I've read it aloud myself, but it's so different with hearing you read it. Thank you. It's, oh, I love it. It's so alliterative and evocative and oh my gosh, it's so good. Thank you so, so much. Okay, so how do you know when the poem's complete? 
Oh my gosh. You know, I think that I wasn't actually going to invest in writing this poem at all because I felt embarrassed by it. Like I felt like cherry be dee, cherry be dumb. Like that didn't make sense to people. Like people are not gonna wanna you know, read that. But there's something about my authenticity rooted in that memory. And I don't even know that children's book that my father read to me, which had those birds that said chirpy dee, chirpy dumb. I don't even know if that's the correct like bird chirp that happened in the children's book. But so I, I read an early version um, of this poem at a reading in Brooklyn. And the poet Marwet, Marwa Halal came up to me after the reading and said, I'd love to teach that poem. Can I, can you email this to me? And she was so kind. This was the first time I met her. And um, she's a dear friend now, you know, but she actually said, um, yeah, it's a great poem. And, and something in her recognized something in me. And so I thought, okay, I'll, I'm going to keep on working on this. I don't think it's the correct, you know, draft yet, but I was also willing to share that at a time when I thought it was still being you know worked on so I think that like I don't know when the poem is done but sometimes I'm ready to share it with people and then like you get you receive a kind of affirmation like that and then you continue to commit to the poem and so I was able to um I was really excited to work with the poet Ilya Kaminsky. I feel like I'm name dropping, but I'm not trying to be cool, but I am trying to say thank you to the people who believed in this poem. Um, but yeah. Ilya Kaminsky actually said to me, um, you know, well, here's what you might want to do. <laughs> and he helps me kind of revise it. And it transformed a lot because of him. But um, I guess that, um, you don't really know when a poem is done, but if it keeps on bugging you, you know, like you, when you're like, oh, it needs to break open still, you need to listen to that. So there's a poem called Americans Dancing in the Heart of Darkness, as well as The Death of Henry Kissinger. Those poems for me, like I had written them, but they were like, something doesn't feel right about these poems. And I think trusting your gut on that is really important. So it took me like, until the very last moment before I turned in the manuscript for me to actually break open that poem, like months before I actually had to submit the manuscript to Copper Canyon. Like I had to let it go at that point, but it took me time. Like I wasn't working on it like voraciously every single day. I couldn't, I couldn't look at this poems, you know, I couldn't look at the poems and like, and just be like, okay, whatever, good enough. I had to like, buy some time so I would kind of be like can I can I turn it in later can I can I turn it in later I would just always ask my editor sure. um but yeah I don't I think that you have to listen to when you have to listen to yourself and you have to like understand that when you think that there's something more when the poem is too like I don't know it's like solid it's like not even like you're sculpting it and you're chipping it away but you actually need to hammer it you know, that's when you are actually breaking open the poem. I hope that makes sense. I'm kind of talking around. It, no, it, 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 it does make sense. I mean, I, I know for me, I, it really almost doesn't matter what it is I've written, whether it's an essay or something in longer or shorter form. Mm -hmm. I, I always find something else to do in it every time I look at it. Yeah. <laughs> I, 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 think it's, I think it's only natural for, for writers, regardless of what the genre is. Yeah, and you're like obsessing over it, but you have to, I, I think I'm, I'm a fan of time. I like to take space from my poem so I can actually have fresher eyes when I look at it again. Yeah, I think that's important too. Yeah. So the, I, even though I suspect I could answer this question, I'm gonna ask it of you anyway. And that is, so what part of the writing process do you derive the most joy from? And, and maybe what do you find the most painful? I, I kind of think like, the things that bring me joy can sometimes bring me pain and especially when mm -hmm. I'm writing um like sometimes so it's it's both it's it's like a double-edged sword right so you are writing something that has never that you've never said before and there's joy in that and sometimes there's pain in that and then when you are working through it Sometimes there's joy and discovery along the way, but sometimes there's immense pain 
because of whatever the subject is that you're focusing on. And even if it's something lighthearted, it could just be your relationship to language at the time. And you're just like, I don't like this poem. It's like, it's like that can be really painful to not have a great relationship to your words. Um, but you yes. might have a joyful you know, experience because you're happy to embrace surprise and discovery, which is great, you know, when that happens. And I'm trying to, trying to develop more, like, uh, I'm trying to develop a practice that is, that is like built on bewilderment um, and, not, and not certainty. I think what happens when you are feeling uh, immense pain while writing, it's because you want certainty. It's because you want, to know what's gonna happen. But language is going to fail you. So you have to also accept that and then, and keep going. You know, that's what we do as writers. We, we accept the limitations of language and we try to break through it. Um, so when you do have that breakthrough, it's immense mm -hmm. joy. <laughs> it's just like, oh, this is incredible. I'm so happy to read a sad poem that brought me a lot of pain to write, but I'm happy to read it because I have somehow created something that is transformative. And hopefully we get there when we write the poem. You know, some poems are not great. <laughs> some poems, we might publish some poems that are actually like, this was not fully realized and we didn't right. know it at the time. Um, so I think the, the, the joy of writing and the, the pain of writing, like they're very much connected, but you can't know one without the other in a way. So I'm really grateful for that question. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's let's uh, take a look more uh, on the style and the writing. Sure. Um, each of your poems has a unique speaker and voice, and whether the character is a grandmother, uh, a sister, an aunt. Uh, so, for example, in your in, in the book "A Nail the Evening Hangs On," uh, in the very first poem of the collection, you said that the speaker of the poem, "Ask the Locals," is an old man sitting outside a shop in Phnom Penh. Mm -hmm. So how do you how do you make decisions regarding um, style and voice, um, and and for you is it a struggle? Yeah, that's a, that's so funny because I remember saying in another interview that when I wrote "Ask the Locals," um, I took on this persona of a man, and I, I know these Khmer men in the streets of Phnom Penh who are just outside sitting on a little stool and they have their beer bellies out and they might be wearing a shirt, but they have their, their shirts rolled over their bellies so you can see their bare bellies. And that's kind of who I was thinking about, you know, when, um, when I wrote Ask the Locals. And it kind mm -hmm. of, for me, it takes on a kind of masculine tone, but I think that like poets like I um, um, are really great at persona. And I, I was reading her work as well when I was um, writing the book. And um, I think that when, when I think about different voices um, in A Nail the Evening Hangs On, um, when I reflect on that, um, I, I have to think about my younger self when I started to write this book in like 2012, 2013. Mm -hmm. um, I think that at the time I was, not sure if I could give myself the permission to add my voice to the narrative of my history, to the narrative of the Khmer Rouge regime and the genocide. And I was really um, cautious about um, my experience because I did not live through that history, but I had to give myself the permission to write because I wanted to write a book that I wanted to read, you know, that I wish I had while I was growing up in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. So when I think about the different voices that I took on, I also understand that I was in a place where I didn't feel fully confident enough to say what I thought about my history, even though I inherited that history, you know, and that and it has affected me deeply, um, without doubt, you know, without a doubt, it has affected me in my everyday life as a daughter of refugees who was born in America. So I thought, well, if I can write poems that in which I use persona and myth making, there's a little distance that can protect me from mm -hmm. actually having to write about violence. Like I didn't want to perpetuate violence, but these personas 
helped me embody a kind of presence that had a little bit more knowledge and information. And um, I think that's part of like the ancestral um, guidance that I was talking about in the very beginning of our interview. Um, but I, I honestly, I don't want to write in persona and for my next book. You know, I've done a lot of personas here. I have some self portraits here, um, mm -hmm. but that's in a sort of, that's in a certain kind of container, you know, self portrait in Seam Reap or self portrait as war museum captions is very much in conversation with history. And maybe Cruel Radiance is a poem about me and my experience of like learning about my history and navigating America as a woman of color. But I don't think mm -hmm. that my full my fullest self really made its way into this particular book as much as I wanted to. Um, mm -hmm. But I think the second book, which I'm working on now, um, I think that is going to be a deeper representation of who I am. Um, and I'm very excited about that. So that's my answer. Well, so you know what we should, I, if, if you've got that available, we should hear that poem. Ask the locals. Nobody knows how those so-called revolutionaries who wanted so-called year zero so bad turned into mosquitoes. I mean, mosquitoes, right? Because not butterflies or moths rolling in the mass graves. We all know the moths are children who didn't make it past five. My theory is those creeps suck the blood of their victims to forget with their bare hands or with other kinds of hands, the kinds with teeth they forgot. Don't forget, if you scratch your arms like that, a huge welt will appear, a rash, and those mosquitoes will keep coming. You heard it from me. Don't scratch their real names. Toothpaste over that bump won't soothe you, not this one. I'll tell you something personal. Every time I hear their real names, I itch my skin. I itch my own name too. Mosquitoes, Call them mosquitoes. This kind keeps going like that mosquito straw your calf keeps sucking. This is when I tell you, don't bend, slap. So I'm gonna move on to another question that relates. In Ode to the Boy Who Jumped Me, you state that the poem is a direct address to the boy to let him know that you saw him even though he didn't see you. Mm -hmm. So, our listeners may not know what that means until we read the poem. So I was gonna say, let's read the poem and then I've got a question about voice. Sure. Ode to the boy who jumped me. You and your friend stood on the corner of the liquor store as I left Champa Garden, take out in hand on the phone with Ashley who said, that was your tough voice. I never heard your tough voice before. I gave you boys a quick nod walked East 21st past dark houses. Before I could reach the lights on park, you crisscrossed your hands around me like a friend. And I'd hoped that you were sang. A boy I kissed on first Friday in October. He paid for my lunch at that restaurant, split the leftovers. But that was a long time ago and we hadn't spoken since. So I dropped to my knees to loosen myself from your grip my back to the ground, I kicked and screamed, but nobody in the neighborhood heard me. Only Ashley on the other line in Birmingham, where they say, how are you to strangers? Not what I said in my tough voice, but what I last texted saying, no response. You didn't get on top, you hovered. My elbows banged the sidewalk. I threw the takeout at you and saw your face, young, more scared of me than I was of you. Hands on my ankles, I thought, you take me or rape me. You said nothing, not even what you wanted. That is a beautiful and wrenching poem. I read that several times the first time I, I looked at that. Um, so the, the, the voice is, 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 uh, is your own, but can you talk about what it's like to write in your own voice, but also write in the voice of another character like you do here? Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, Ode to the Boy Who Jumped to Me is certainly written in my voice. Um, and, and Ask the Locals, which I read earlier, um, is written in the voice of another person that I kind of channeled. Mm -hmm. Having that, that, having stripped away any kind of persona and just kind of embodying the poem myself, 
um, is also a way to like, I guess, address violence um, directly. But I had to find ways of empowering my narrative outside of persona, outside of myth-making. And I think that something I learned about direct language is that you could simply describe what happened and that is in, in and of itself empowering to your narrative. Mm -hmm. So when we actually name what happened, that can be empowering. And nowhere in the poem, I hope, do I perpetuate the violence, but I do witness not only myself in the poem, but the boy who jumps me. And I even offer a little compassion you know, I threw the takeout at you and saw your face young, more mm -hmm. scared of me than I was of you. And just being able to acknowledge that, um, I think is empowering, you know? So there was no need for myth to happen here. There was no need to build a persona, to create safety. Um, I think the poem itself created a space for that safety to, um, in which I could actually operate in my memory. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, you know, this, yeah, it's a true story. So, so sometimes I think it's uncomfortable um, when I've had people reach out to me about this poem because they want to mm -hmm. talk to me about things that happened to them. And sometimes yes. like strangers will be like, this is a great poem. But I'm so sorry that happened to you. <laughs> and I'm just, I'm like, yeah, yeah, thank you. <laughs> you know, but but I don't know if I want that attention, you know. So I think that I'm learning how that feels to kind of write a poem in my voice and and um like every all the poems, even the persona poems, even like all the poems I write, I feel a little bit exposed. And the poems that are certainly about me, the author, I feel exposed and I feel like. I don't really have control over how people receive that, but I do have to set boundaries in a way. Um, and in a way I set boundaries with me and the boy who jumped me in the actual poem. Like I have this poem in tercets, you know, I'm pushing it along and um, I'm ha I have a direct address. And this is not a, po a poem that will curse the boy who jumped me. It's actually a, <laughs> it's an ode, which is also strange. Mm -hmm. So um, I think that there are lots of ways that I'm discovering how to um, use my, my words, use my voice, but I don't think that, I don't know if I will ever write a poem that will, that will harm somebody. You know, I hope I don't. But then again, I have the death of Henry Kissinger, you know, and, and that's mm -hmm. a poem that's like, well, you're still alive, but I'm going to write about Henry Kissinger's death. You know, I'm going to write about your death because you basically wrote the death of many, many people that you didn't even, you calculated their deaths and you didn't care. So in that poem though, I say this is rebirth as revenge. So instead of taking away something through language in a response to violence, I'd rather generate something that is solid you know, and, and well, even, even choosing to write it as an ode, which is, which is, you know, a poetic form that we think of as a celebration of someone or something, um, you turned it on its ear. But I think, I think that's one of the reasons why it's so effective. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so when, when you are approaching a poem, um, does form necessarily follow subject for you? Yeah. Um, hmm. I certainly, um, I certainly wrote a Sestina in this book and I called it Sestina, but all of the repeating end words were hidden. So um, that poem is about like my mother and her sisters who were surviving in these labor camps um, and they would have to work in the fields, but sometimes, you know, like my mother would also hide. And there's so many of them that the comrades didn't know if anyone was missing. So mm -hmm. I wanted to write about their experience, but I thought that it was too, um, that the form of the Sestina was too predictable um, while writing about these young girls who were hiding and trying to survive. So the- And yet you stuck, you stuck with the form. Yeah, I stuck with the form, mm -hmm. but I, the form is there. But the ending mm -hmm. part, 
patterns are not at the end, right. you know, but they're all right. repeated throughout. Um, yeah. So I think that that is an obvious poem to talk about when with that in the um, just according to that question that you just asked yeah. about form and subject, but um, I I don't think I gravitate towards like writing sonnets as much as some people do. You know, they like to have that sort of structure. Um, but what I like to do is I like to, you know, allow the language to lead me. And sometimes I might have a poem that's like 12 lines and somebody will say, you could make that a sonnet. <laughs> and I'll be like, well, I don't want it to be a sonnet. So <laughs> I'm a little bit resistant to form, um, especially because, um, well, these are not poetic traditions that are in and of my people. And um, mm -hmm. I don't know the forms, the Cambodian poetry forms, because I can't speak Khmer fluently. And um, I'd like to work on that. But those Khmer poetic forms, um, I'd ha I have to learn. I have to learn them. I'm, I'm invigorated by those forms. And I hope I hope one day that I can explore that more and perhaps, you know, turn to translation at some point. Um, so that's a goal of mine. But I do think that um, writing hustles has been fun for me. Um, writing prose poems has been also fun. I have a prose poem in this book as well. But um, when it comes to writing, having written, having written an L the evening hangs on and being in conversation with form, it didn't really make it, it's not like for me it's not a huge it's not a huge presence in the book like form itself uh, traditional forms it, it's because this history has been so silenced erased and marginalized I didn't want to contain it in a kind of you know in a kind of structure that never contained it before so mm -hmm. yeah I hope that makes sense mm -hmm. it makes perfect sense you know it strikes me that we're in kind of a golden age of poetic form. In other words, you know, we're, we're referencing some more archaic forms like sonnets and villanelles, mm -hmm. uh, sestinas, maybe I'm referencing a villanelle. Yeah. Um, but it seems to me that, um, that a lot of young poets in particular are taking and creating brand new forms um, and, and not, not sitting pat with, with these very traditional hundreds and hundreds of year old forms, which I find particularly interesting and intriguing um, so I like that. Yeah, yeah. And I, and I have a, the, my, my confession is I've, I have taught, uh, among other genres, I've taught poetry for years. And I have to say, even with the Sestina, I always have to reference my notes when I'm teaching it, which is embarrassing. I've taught it for so many years, but I still always have to look at the form like, okay, so how do you write the Sestina? Yeah. yeah. Gotta... <laughs> I would do this again. I, I always have to do the same thing though. Um, but I think that's okay. I don't think we have to know. <laughs> we don't have to memorize the form to know. Well, that. yeah, I guess I mean, it's probably true. But you know, if you've been teaching as long as me, it's probably no excuse for not. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Already. <laughs> All right. So you said that you started writing poetry because you had questions about your your own history, and you mentioned that you've had other questions now and are writing new poems. So what is it that drew you specifically to writing poetry? Mm -hmm. as opposed to maybe fiction. I know you've talked about being interested in writing more essays as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's so funny because I was actually just really interested in writing fiction when I started out as a creative writing student um, in, in like college in uh, American University. And it's so funny that I, I took a fiction class first and I was excited about it. And then one day, like I started to write poetry and I, I took a poetry class alongside the fiction class and mm. I went to my fiction professor and I said, can I read a poem to you? And she was like, mm, no, <laughs> she, oh she really didn't want to hear a poem because she was so uncomfortable with that, that uh, genre, I guess. I thought that was really funny. But then I turned wow. to the dark side, you know, I, I went to the dark side and I started writing more poetry. And I don't know what it is about poetry that allows me to, you know, that allows me to say what I need to say, but there is only a short amount of time in a poem. I mean, poems can be very long. You can have book length poems, but the poems that I've written that were in conversation with my family's history, um, 
made sense it made sense that I was going to write poetry because um I wanted to think about certain angles of my history very small angles that may be overlooked I'm mm -hmm. trying to get like the dark corners of that history and actually bring it into focus so I think poetry allows me to really um engage on a, in a much deeper level you can make something really small and specific just huge and important and I thought that that was so incredible you know that I thought wow I I want to I want to focus on one moment instead of feeling overwhelmed by an entire you know an entire history of genocide like if I were to write a whole novel about that I don't know what that would look like and maybe that will happen later on in the future but mm -hmm. Poetry has given me a way to liberate myself from the pressure of something so grand as history. Um, and because my family was so silent about the genocide while I was growing up in Pennsylvania, they were so, um, they were traumatized, you know, they were very, very quiet. Uh, and sometimes they'd talk about what happened, but it wasn't a sit down conversation where they would say, you have to know what happened we want to pass this knowledge down to you. Um, they kind of, you know, my parents just kind of, they kind of just um, took care of themselves in the way that they needed to and took care of our family in the context of Lancaster, Pennsylvania. And so I just, I think that, you know, I kind of, um, I had to break through that silence so in a way, I was also talking to myself in small moments. Um, and I had to recall, I had to recall certain moments with my parents in order to like try and get their voices into the poetry as well. Um, I hope that, you know, I hope that is enough. Uh, I just, I think that it's overwhelming to have engaged with a genocide, you know, um, the history of genocide. It's overwhelming to have simply inherited the fact that my parents survived that mm -hmm. trauma and that experience in the world and and nobody was nobody was watching Cambodia you know and and nobody knew what was happening in the world what was happening in Cambodia so that's a lot to hold um, and I and I have to be able to take it like one thing at a time and there are lots of poems I wrote that didn't make its way into the first book. But um, I think that the poems that did make its way into the first book, um, I, I did it with a lot of care. And I think the poems allowed me to like take it slow. You know, I needed to do that. Writing this book was psychically draining, but it was also very healing for me to do. So um, that helped me undo that silence that I also inherited from my family. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. When it comes to reading your work aloud, I, I've noted it um, looking at some things that are online, some, some readings that you've done. Um, and certainly from here today, I think you do it exceptionally well. You know, I, I, I think it's, it's, it's certainly not a given for a writer to be a good oral reader, to, even of her own work. And um, I, 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 I've been to so many readings over the years of fiction writers and screenwriters and poets and 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 you know I mean pretty much any genre I can imagine, mm -hmm. and I'm I've I've I'm no longer surprised when I'm when I'm disappointed by the quality of the reading, and so um, my question to you would be how, what advice would you have for a younger writer when it comes to reading reading her work aloud, yeah, or 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 even just being, um, being able to present in public. Well, I think that reading slowly is really important. Um, I even, you know, I think that there are times I read my poems too fast. Um, but just kind of holding your own attention to the line or, you know, to the sentence, whatever it is that you're reading, um, I think it's important to just slowly read what you're saying so that people have the time to respond to the actual language. Um, 
so much of what we do is like in our heads. So then when we actually share it out loud, we think it makes sense to everybody. But when we receive it, sometimes it's just like, oh, I, I, I didn't get that because I had no idea what you were saying. It was too quick of a reading. It was too fast. But also to enunciate and like um, emphasize certain words, you know, that, mm -hmm. that, that capture a, a tonal shift. Um, I think it's important to pay attention to that because you reading the work out loud, um, it's an opportunity to kind of build the world um, through the reading of a poem. On the page, you know, you can read the poem on the page and just um, kind of intuit or, you know, just infer the tonal shifts. But when you read a poem and it's just one flat tone, I think that's when I get bored. When, yes. um, yeah, the, it's just, you have to, you have to have a, a little bit of emotion <laughs> when you're reading the poem. But sometimes there's too much emotion. <laughs> sometimes there's too much emotion. And then, right. you're like, hey, wait, wait, calm, just like bring it down a notch, you know, but yeah, yeah. So, all right, so I'm gonna move on to the more, the, the miscellaneous personal round. Okay, let's go. <laughs> you capture um, experience and emotion clearly and evocatively in your work. Um, emotions can resonate with a variety of people, mm -hmm. but specific experiences aren't necessarily things that everyone can have similar knowledge of to you, obviously. So you write in your essay on fear, fearlessness, and intergenerational trauma, which you've referenced earlier, that while writing in school, you were afraid that your work or your words didn't hold space with others. Mm -hmm. So for folks that are just discovering your work, who may not be familiar with the experience of the Khmer Rouge regime, how do you recommend their approach to learning that history? Well, there's a lot out there. Um, there's Google. <laughs> we can Google things, but also <laughs> we can Google things. Um, I mean, I, I have to also uh, be humble and say, you know, I'm still learning about my history and I'm still learning about the history of others and our collective histories. So I Google things, you know, and I, I say that with humor, but I seriously, I want to learn things. I think it actually begins with your willingness to even actively see what happened in the past and how that applies to the present day. I think it's important for me to understand this history of genocide that I've inherited so that I can understand myself better. And then I can also understand that today with the protests for George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and Ahmaud Arbery and so many others, Tony McDade, Nina Pop, like mm -hmm. that black people in America are going through genocide too. And um, I mean, I just have to speak about some of that history a little bit. Um, I also teach at the Center for Empowering Refugees and Immigrants. And um, there was actually a community event. It was a teach-in that um, Kamai organizers were doing to educate our elders about Black Lives Matter. And um, there was a map that was shown of the U.S. during the 1980s. And this is a map um, that showed where U.S. prisons were being built during like the war on drugs, you know, Reagan era. And that was in the 1980s. So then the next map that was shown was 1980s US, which cities, um, which cities, uh, it, it showed the cities in which Southeast Asian refugees resettled in the US, right? Mm -hmm. Same time period. But if you superimpose one map over the other, you would actually see that the cities where Southeast Asian refugees were resettled in America were the same cities where US prisons were being built at the height of mass incarceration. Mm -hmm. And those same cities are being heavily policed. So we had to connect you know, our history um, as refugees alongside the history of Black people in America and that history of racism. And we asked the question, well, what happens when you put two races together in a heavily policed city, what happens, how, how do both of these people survive? How do these communities survive? Um, and and it, just, it just was a very generative experience um, 
that teach-in uh, for the elders at the Center for uh, Empowering Refugees and Immigrants. And it was such a beautiful moment because the elders understood what racism was about. They understood mm -hmm. the, that impact, that, that system of oppression and how, you know, how we needed to address anti-Blackness and understand how we are actually connected with Black folks in America. And so that was a really beautiful and, and important teach-in that my community did. And we are always constantly learning, you know? So I think where people can begin is when they, where, where they can begin with like learning about the Cambodian genocide. Well, you know, you have to start with yourself. You have to know your own history. Um, it's like that important saying that, that I, is, is something I've heard in many social justice circles, no history, no self, K-N-O-W, like no, or no mm. history, no self, N-O, no history, no self. So mm. you have to know where you, where you um, stand in, in not in the, just, just in this country, but in like the larger world. Um, it's important to know your own history in order to connect it to my history, um, in order to connect it to the Cambodian genocide. And it's beautiful when we can stand in solidarity together. And so I do tell people to take the time to learn about the Cambodian genocide. And maybe some people are like, well, that's so removed from who I am. No, it's not. We share that history together. And we've got, and if you don't think it's something that you need to know, then you need to implicate yourself. You need to ask yourself, why doesn't this genocide matter to me? And why doesn't the genocide of Syrians matter to me? Or Black people in America matter to me? So we got to ask ourselves, or, or Indigenous people, you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we got to ask ourselves what we care about. Yeah. You have referenced your, your family um, during the interview. You, you reference your family a lot in your writing. Um, if, I, if, if you're comfortable responding to this, I'm, I'm curious as to how they respond to your work. Yeah, <laughs> they, don't, they don't really fully understand my writing. <laughs> like there are so many times where I said, mom and dad, I got a fellowship, it's at Stanford. And they're like, great, when are you going to get a job? <laughs> so, so they don't really understand the weight of that, you know, but oh, I don't it doesn't matter to me. Like they don't know what Stanford really means um they don't yeah. know it's a prestigious institution and and that's yeah. okay because stanford doesn't really know who my parents are you know so <laughs> but um when they read my poetry they try to read it slowly and i'm always like oh no they're going to know what i'm saying about them but but also there have been times where i've read my poems and they've been in the audience and they actually really feel moved and affirmed yeah. So that when when we talk again, they're they're telling me a story, and they're like, "Oh, you're gonna write a poem about this." <laughs> so, mm -hmm. I'm I'm grateful that they are willing to embrace it now. But so many times they just they were like, "What are you doing with your life?" You know, and, and it's it's a strange thing. What are what am I doing with my life as a poet? Um, mm -hmm. But I'm nervous about them reading my second book or my third book because you know they might they might get different parts of me that I, I don't talk to them about, but mm -hmm. I want to be able to be my most authentic self in the poem. So hopefully they won't understand it. <laughs> so hopefully poetry is too hard for them, but the essays, you know, like maybe they'll understand that, but I also yeah. just want to be comfortable with people seeing me. And I, I, think yeah. I, I think I welcome my family actively seeing me. I just hope they don't actively shame me as well. You know, if I write about mm -hmm. my experience as a woman, um, or my sexuality, or like, you whatever. Like, I just, I don't want to. I just, I don't want to. I don't want to know what that's like yet. I'm gonna write those poems, but I'm not going to. Um, I'm not going to worry about it right now. <laughs> so, <laughs> mm -hmm. my uh, my my daughters are singer songwriters, and and they have there have been there have been a couple of songs along the way that they are oh, okay. a, they are a little. Uh, uh, they don't necessarily want me to hear it lyrically. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> They're just like, just listen but, to the beat, Dad. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm like, whatever, man. I am all about the art. Go for it. Yeah, amazing. That's yeah. so. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, what what advice do you have for for writers who who perhaps have gone through some sort of trauma and 
and want to communicate it artistically, mm -hmm. how, how would you advise them? Um, I would just say, take your time and uh, be gentle with yourself. I would say um, there's no rush to know everything right now. I, I understand how agonizing the writing process can be or any kind of art making. I understand, especially when you're actually putting something out into the world that has to do with your trauma mm -hmm. uh, or with, with a trauma uh, of a loved one or something that requires you to think, well, what does this person feel about me writing about their trauma like or how do how does how does how do like this entire people feel about like my community how do they feel about me writing about our history you know so I think it's okay to take your time um go for a walk like clear your head cook for yourself learn something new uh beside the writing so that you're not just so focused on this one specific you know poem that you have um life has to happen while you're writing and and I think that I think that we also have to give space to heal you know um as we're living and writing and creating like I said earlier I don't want to write poems that are harmful to others and I really do not I hope that it's not harmful to others mm -hmm. And I hope that it doesn't perpetuate the violence that we are looking at directly. But in that process, we also have to kind of protect ourselves and create a safe space for ourselves to even engage with those narratives of violence. Um, and, and there's no need to find that particular way to, to do the poem. Um, we just have to take our time and, and listen deeply, go inwards, but also engage with the world. And that's a, a strange thing to say because we're in a pandemic. I mean, I'm sheltering in place alone. I don't even like to use the word shelter in place. It's kind of a strange thing to, cause I don't hear people saying it now, but you know, the holidays are coming up. <laughs> like I'm just kind of like hanging out here. I might see people at a distance, but um, it's a hard thing to think about, well, how do you actually engage with the world? and? I think Ocean Vuong has um, a line in one of his poems that says that you like remember that time spent alone is still time spent with the world, you know, and um, I think that's a tremendous, that's a tremendous thing for me to hear as mm -hmm. I'm through this experience um, yeah. that is a collective trauma that we're going through now. Um, so. I think we're all going through it and and we can still like create poems that are intimate when we can't even touch each other you know there's a lot that i can say about how we write poetry and like and how we engage with our own traumas when we're writing about that specific thing but I do think just take care of yourself, um, allow yourself to live fully and heal and um, take your time. That's the best thing I can say. And, you know, some of, one of the best advice I ever got from another poet, Brenda Shaughnessy, she said, go where the love is. And that's also mm -hmm. a rule of thumb I have in my poetry. Mm -hmm. I like it, sound advice. <laughs> You're very active in terms of social justice initiatives and your Twitter account has a link tree with resources and organizations for social justice, including hashtag Asians for abolition and the hashtag stop ice transfers toolkit and in defense of black life, a Cambodian community conversation. So what is the relationship between poetry and social justice? And, and really I could expect, I, I know you're a poet, I, I kind of want to say the arts and social justice uh, and, and how you hope to inspire people through your work. Well, when I think about social justice work, um, there are many different ways to contribute to uh, the liberation of others, um, to your own liberation and so, I honestly think that there have been times where I just didn't think what I was doing as a writer was enough. But you do need the artists. You do need the storytellers. 
you do need somebody who will cook for everybody. Um, I've got elders who have shown up to rallies and they brought snacks, you know? <laughs> and, and you have the people on the megaphone in front of ICE detention center and you have someone, you know, from the temple who is translating the words of elders and someone else is saying, well, how, how do we say when we fight, we win in Khmer? Well, then now someone can educate the young people and we'll say it together, you know? So um, we've got the children running around <laughs> in the community center when there's a huge meeting about the next anti-deportation rally that we're going to have. So we need all, all different parts of our community to show up in every single way that they can show up. Um, but the children is also like, when I say children running around, like, well, they're creating joy for us. They're also reminding us that we're doing it for them too. Um, so I think there's a lot of different ways that we contribute. Um, and, and who's to say this is what an activist is and who's to say this is what you're supposed to do to help, you know, social justice causes. Like, I think mm -hmm. what, what's important is that, you know, you could just be reading a book, educating yourself about social justice, you know, causes. Like maybe you're reading about like um, Black Lives Matter. Maybe you're reading, um, well, I have this book by Adrienne Marie Brown. It's called Emergent Strategy. And I haven't necessarily started reading it yet, but um, it's called, it's uh, Shaping Change, Changing Worlds. And so I'm very excited to get into it. Um, but you know, it's just that commitment to learning all the time. But for me as a writer um, and how that connects to social justice work, I think that I am trying my best to actively see my people and those I stand with, other black, brown, indigenous communities, um, I'm actively trying to see all of us um, and, and those who are especially like marginalized and erased, right? Um, from, from these racist policies and stuff like that. Like it just, there's so much that's happening. That's just so much chaos. But as a writer, I'm trying to actively see these people and I'm trying to center them now in the poem so that there's no way you cannot see them, whoever reads the poem. Um, and I'm trying my best to, to allow myself to, to be the writer in my community and just like write what I'm seeing because I'm doing that work within myself. Like, again, I'm starting with myself, my history and showing up in the world as someone who is, who is, um, who actually cares to, to say, Hey, I'm a little bit ignorant on this subject. Or, mm -hmm. oh, oh my goodness, I was racist in this moment. I need to unlearn that, you know? I need to commit to the anti-racist work that I wanna do. Um, or maybe this is something that was full of, um, I don't know, hatred. And now I need to, un you know, decondition myself in a way so that I can open up my heart and mind to others. And I'm actually taking a compassion class. So I think that there's a, a lot of Buddhist like thought that's making its way into my my answers, but I mm -hmm. really, really, um, I'm here to kind of be a little bodhisattva, you know, I'm kind of here as a poet in that way, and I, I want to show up in that way in the social justice work that I'm committed to doing. But yes, like Asians for Abolition, let me learn more about the prison industrial complex, um, and let me let me speak about these things with my students and with my friends. And it just starts, it starts so small. Like it's just so, it's just about really paying attention and poetry is about paying attention. So it just makes sense to me that creators, artists, we're the ones who will pay attention and will center what we need to center in order to start the conversation for those who haven't started yet. And, and to continue the conversation for those who have and to affirm those who are most affected. So um, that's a kind of general overview, but I think I'm still on that journey of understanding and discovering who I am in these kinds of movement work. Um, mm -hmm. But I do think that I am a cultural worker. Um, and, and it's very exciting to be able to claim that and to say, well, here's what I love and here's what I'm going to tell you and hope, I hope that you'll listen. 
I, I wonder if you're the rare artist who does not have an inner critic or an inner editor hanging over you. <laughs> I'll, I'll leap to the conclusion that you may not be. <laughs> How do you fight that if, if you do have one? I definitely am critical of myself. I know I can sound, I sound very compassionate um, but I can be really hard on myself, which is why I'm taking that class. <laughs> so, <laughs> but, but I don't know. I, I think that it's, it's like really hard. You know, I am a woman of color. I am a Khmer woman. My history is not acknowledged, you know, most of the time when we're learning about the war in Vietnam. Um, there's a lot that I feel, you know, I, I feel a lot of suffering in those ways, but, um, I know for a fact that me being able to offer like that kind of insight, it comes from somewhere because it comes from me having been so critical of myself and everything that I was trying to do that I became like really paralyzed at one point while I was writing my first book. I could not revise or edit. I could not actually move forward with the book. Um, I asked the book to be delayed in its publication and that was granted, but I was being really, really judgmental of myself. And I realized um, that was not going to help me write the book. And when you are very hard on yourself and I have led a whole life of being hard on myself and um, had like a lot of people, my family, you know, I, and I grew up like as one of, I was one of the few people of color in my classes, you know, like it's very hard to exist fully. And the book required me to exist fully. So I had to show up for that. But how can you show up for that when you're hard on yourself? So um, I've had to learn a lot about compassion, but I certainly have spent time in artist residencies where I didn't write and I just could not even read, you know? So there is a lot of pain in that way because you mentioned pain and then you mentioned joy now I know and now I know how much joy I have because I've written this book but only because I've had so much pain so um but I'm learning especially now during this pandemic to be kind to myself mm. there's no other way to be um it's hard it's hard to to also grieve so much you know um how can you really heal how can you really look at um, your your painful histories when you're not even kind to yourself, you know? So I think that's so important, kindness. And that's the hardest thing to do sometimes. Um, it's hard to, to be compassionate in your, in your work. But I think that slowly I've had to, I, I had like, I was at rock bottom at one point, then I had to actually, I had to build myself up and I had to, continue to affirm myself, even though I didn't even believe that I was X, Y, and Z. You know, I was telling myself, oh, you're enough. And I didn't believe it until I said it so many times to myself that I was like, okay, it's true. <laughs> you know, you can manifest things by saying them out loud. And um, I do that to my students, my youth, um, my Khmer girls, my Southeast Asian youths. I tell them, uh, that they're enough. And then they have to say, thank you, I know. And it's awkward. And then they have to tell someone else, you're enough. And that person has to say, thank you, I know. Then we all do it in the circle. And mm -hmm. it's awkward in the beginning, but by the end of our time together, they know it and it's beautiful. And uh, nobody will tell you that you're enough. But if you know that, it's easier then to, to give yourself the permission to write your poems. Thank you for that. That is, uh, I, I love that kind of self-affirmation um, and it's beautiful advice. I, so I, I, I ask this for every interview. What's on your nightstand right now? On my nightstand? I don't have a nightstand, but I do have a bunch of books. It's the um, metaphorical nightstand. Let <laughs> me grab my book. So I have, um, I have a lot of books. You already saw Emergent Strategy by Adrienne Marie Brown, but I also have the selected poetry of Yehuda Amakai. Um, I love the poem, A Pity We Were Such a Good Invention. I love that poem. I got from the library 
because they just I get to just pick up from them. I got Black Nature. Gay library. Yes, thank you for the pitch for the library. Love, love Oakland Public Library. <laughs> the Black Nature, um, edited by Camille Dungy. Oh my God, I, I can't wait to read this book, but this is Wanda Coleman, Wicked Enchantment. Mm. I, I think we, uh, The Black-Handed Curse is a book I really, or a poem I really want to read later today because a friend recommended it. Then I have The Historians by Ivan Boland, um, the late Ivan Boland, who was a professor of mine. Um, it's, it's tough to grieve her, you know? Then I've got Dick T by Teresa Hakim Cha. It's a really important text. And also Margaret Ross's A Timeshare. And I, I, I love- Thank you for for holding these up for our viewers and listeners. For sure. <laughs> All right, so um, I'm a musician, so I, I have to ask this question as well. What am I gonna find on a Monica Sook playlist? Oh my gosh, um, you might find Little Dragon. Do you like Little Dragon? <laughs> I don't know enough Little Dragon. Okay, maybe, you, maybe you'll listen to Little Dragon, but I also, I'm like looking at my Spotify now. Sorry yeah. I'm on my phone, but <laughs> you asked the oh, question. It's okay if you're going to get your Spotify. <laughs> I mean, oh, I like um, Vagabond. Vagabond uh -huh. is a new Cameroonian American artist and Michael Q. I actually just read a re review of that. Okay, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I, I just love, yeah, Michael Kiwanuka, Elado Negro, um, yep. and I've been listening to the new um, Fiona Apple, so I really like that album. <laughs> okay, I'm going to put in a pitch for Fiona Apple right now. I, I think, okay, first off, probably my top three favorite artists, and uh, that new album yeah. is, for me, it's the best album of the year of anybody I've heard, <laughs> Yeah, and I am on it with Fridays with new releases that is an absolute That's masterpiece great. all right so i've got one more question for you and um it's so so uh, there was a uh, a nasa mission uh, a couple weeks ago that collected some material from the asteroid bennu and if all works out well that the material is actually coming back to our planet and um <laughs> it's also an asteroid that um, mathematically as a possibility of actually hitting our planet at some point. So here's my question to you, Monica. If an asteroid is headed straight for your house, what are the five items that you're going to grab? It doesn't have to be the asteroid bedroom because I think yeah. it's a thousand miles or a thousand miles down the road. <laughs> I mean, I love that you talk about, you're talking about this asteroid, but also I've been thinking a lot about what I'm supposed to take when, um, just because this fire season in California, well, it might be over. It's kind right. of now, but but um, I've been thinking a lot about what I'm supposed to take. But you know, I think you're talking about like what sentimental items I should I would take. Is that correct? Instead of like it survival doesn't, things, it doesn't necessarily matter. <laughs> anything. I, I, I grab a computer, and that's not terribly sentimental. <laughs> that's yeah. That's um. That's needed though. That's necessary. <laughs> I think I would take um. Okay. I'm just going to look around at what I have here. Now that you said computer, I would probably take my computer. When you heard someone knocking on my door as I was reading Ask the Locals, um, they were giving me like a desktop um, and uh, that was a delivery I was expecting, which came earlier, but I wouldn't take the desktop. Thanks. I would take my iPad, which I hope is in there <laughs> and my MacBook. So let me count that as one thing, computer technology, so I can okay, stay connected to the world. Okay. <laughs> my phone, yeah. like, okay, whatever. That's one answer. But I would probably take, okay. um, I would take my, um, there's a searchlight that my mother gave me and um, I would take that. Um, I would also take my tarot deck. <laughs> this, is, this is my lioness oracle tarot deck. So I would, I would, you know, I would take that with me um, in case, you know, that, that's necessary. I think that's important. I would take, um, I would try to take my plants. I mean, you see this golden pothos here, but I kind of like the philodendron. It's a Swiss cheese variety mm -hmm. one. So that's like what, three, four things? That's great. That's four. The computer, the philodendron. It is four, right? We're the philodendron. Yeah. yeah. The philodendron. And also um, the tarot cards. Um, I would also take 
well, I would I would be smart and pack um, I would pack at least uh some clothes, you know, like I would pack at least some running shoes. <laughs> I, I don't know what I expect to run. I would wear my running shoes, but I would pack another one <laughs> to take alongside uh, some warm clothing um, because, yeah, this is such a funny question because I am a daughter of genocide survivors. So I'm like, well, what would I take? I'm like, I'm trying to be, have fun with the, the questions, um, but I'm also like, well, let me just make sure I have water as well. And let me make sure I have rice. <laughs> things that I would actually take but I would just you know an emergency backpack would be would be like a given but those are some five those are five things I would probably take. I want to thank you so sincerely for um, just a, a lovely time. Thank you so much Ted take care.